That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. <clears throat> what a song. Thank you, Brass. Thank you very much. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. That is the blessed hope that ignites every friend of God's heart, isn't it? We shall behold him. In this life, it's faith by faith. But one day soon, it's going to be face to face. Thank you, Jennifer LaMountain and the brass. Powerful. It's good to have brass now and then, isn't it? Just to stir the soul and the blood and the heart. And, ah, that was wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's nice to have them. They're from all over this nation. You heard the, the states and the campuses they represent. We are honored to have them. In fact, Jennifer and Lionel, her husband, used to be right here at Andrews University. He was one of my students at the Theological Seminary. He's down right now in Jacksonville, Florida, with a crowd who are participating tonight in our next Millennium Seminar, and we are proud of both of them. One of our translators just handed this to me as I was coming on tonight. This is a, an email that we got today from a lady in Vishku, Vishku, in the Czech Republic. She emailed this in. Apparently, she's attended eight of our Next Millennium Seminar lectures. And here is Daniel Duda, our Slovakian translator's interpretation. And I hope she's watching tonight. We got your message. She writes, it's fantastic. I discovered I'm hooked on this. Bless your soul. My, this is better than Dallas. <laughs> I don't know if she means a TV program or the city, but either way, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> I do not know what I do when this is over. Well, my dear friend, I know what you're going to do. You're going to keep growing your forever friendship with God, and he's going to grow it with you. But we are so delighted to have you and all your friends in Vishku, the uh, Czech Republic, wherever you are tonight. What a night to be here. I am, I am so excited about tonight's lecture, and I need to tell you why. I am excited because I know that the world is intrigued with what you and I are going to be getting into in just a few moments. Why do I know the world's intrigued? I want to tell you a story. It happened just last week. I haven't had a chance to tell you yet. Last Monday, my telephone rang. I picked it up. Voice on the other end said, Hello, I'm Leslie Clapp. I'm a TV producer with BET. That's Black Entertainment Television. By the way, that is the largest black cable network in the United States, and it's seen outside this nation as well. She said, I got a hold of something in the mail. And I said, uh, what was that? She said, well, it's one of these uh, Next Millennium Seminar brochures. I said, I've heard of that seminar. <laughs> she said, I got a hold of one of these in the mail. And Dwight Nelson, I'm wondering, we have a program coming up tomorrow night with Tavis Smiley in the BET Tonight Show. And by the way, he is the Larry King of black television. Tavis Smiley's got a program tomorrow night, sir, and his topic is, How Close Are We to the End of the World? Whoa, I said, that's intriguing. She said, yes, and I read this brochure, and I'm wondering, would you be willing to fly into Washington, D.C. and be on our program tomorrow night? Well, don't clap, because I couldn't go. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I cannot do that because Tuesday night, that's a week ago last night, Tuesday night, we got a global moment on satellite, and no, I've got to be right here. She said, all right. She said, well, then what, what if, can you turn one of those satellite dishes out there and aim it towards Washington, D.C.? I said, I'm going to call our producer. So I called Warren Judd up in the control room. I said, hey, Warren, what do you think? He said, Dwight, let me check it out. He said, I think it's doable. We got the green light. I called her back, and I said, listen, Leslie, we can do it. So last Tuesday night, a week ago last night, while you were asleep in bed at 11 o'clock, empty church, dark except for a few lights up there, I'm sitting on a stool in front of those flags, hooked up by satellite with Tavis Smiley, a minister guest of his from Washington, D.C., a biologist who believes the world, the ecosystem is imploding, 
And little old me here in Michigan, four of us on national television, we're taking calls from across the nation, and for 45 minutes, we talk about how close are we to the end of the world. That's why I'm terribly excited about this subject you and I are going to share tonight, because the world is intrigued. They're asking it out there on major television networks. Where are we in the stream of time? Tonight's lecture, learning how to forecast the future. How close are we to the end? I'm eager to get into this with you, but I want to have a word of prayer with you before we begin our study tonight. And we always have a prayer because no sense in getting into the book without inviting the author himself to impress our minds. So let's pray. Father, we shall behold him, our Lord Jesus, one day. That was the great news in our, our study last evening as the lecture it developed. We saw that that is the shining hope of this ancient document, a hope that is getting closer and closer. Now, Lord, they're asking it all over the planet tonight. A thinking man, a thinking woman. You can't be a thinking person and not wonder how close are we to the end. And so, Father, as we ask you that question, and as we go to this book, let it be clear. Open our minds and our hearts. Let us sense this moment, this rendezvous with destiny that this generation has. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the, the problem with weather forecasters is they aren't always right. I mean, have you noticed that? I, I suppose it's part of their occupational hazard, although imagine my surprise to learn, get this, somebody has invented a special ribbon that can actually forecast the weather. That's no, true. What, what it is, is a little, uh, it's a, a little cheerful ribbon of yarn woven in all the colors of the rainbow. And by the way, I've got to just shoot off here. Did you see the rainbow coming in tonight? There were two of them. Wasn't that spectacular? We get rainbows here in Michigan world. Just thought you ought to know that. Beautiful rainbow. Anyway, this little ribbon in the shape of a rainbow, all the colors of the rainbow, and there's some instructions that come with this ingenious forecasting device. Here, here are the directions. I'll put them up on the screen for you. Number one, hang outside window. Good. Number two, check each morning. Number three, if it's wet, it's raining. Number four, if it's stiff, it's freezing. Number five, if it's white, it's snowing. Number six, if it's moving, it's windy. Number seven, if it's faded, it's sunny. And number eight, if it's gone, it's been ripped off. Whoa, what an ingenious device. I'd like to have one of those, wouldn't you? Wow. Don't you wish that forecasting the weather were that simple? Hey, wait a minute. Don't you wish that forecasting the future were that simple? But then again, knowing what lies just ahead of us in this foreboding march of the human race may be more simple than you first thought. Because what we're about to share together tonight is the it's astounding, ancient, prediction of how this world is going to end. And what you are about to read, I'm telling you, this is called high-octane prophecy, literally, actually, precisely describing events on this planet just before the end, before the return of Jesus Christ. By the way, any resemblance to the present is absolutely intentional. So, let's go. Now, wait a minute before we go. I'm going to say this right up front. I'm telling you, with all the earnestness in my heart, I believe we are living in the final generation of this planet. Now, look, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet, but I read the prophets. And I'm convinced that we are there. We are here right now. In fact, Jesus made a statement once, a very provocative statement. One slashing line, and he exposes. I, every time I read this line, I'm saying, God, this is the truth about this generation right now. I want you to get the, the, the psyche of a generation at the end of time, the Titanic generation, if you please. Let's go to Jesus tonight to open with. In fact, we'll be with him almost the entire lecture. This is the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 21, page 1019. Luke, chapter 21. Those of you with our Next Millennium Seminar Bibles here, by the way, these are not Bibles we had printed up, especially the text is the text that belongs to the whole planet. We put some covers on it. That's what makes it the Next Millennium Seminar Bible. It's the New King James Version. This is Luke chapter 21. 
I'd like you to read, please, verse 26. You want to get the psyche of the end time generation? Here it is, verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I, I study a lot in my early morning time out of the New Revised Standard Version. And I like the way it puts it. The, Jesus said, people will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. Now, which generation is this? Well, please read verse 27. Then they will see, aha, this is a generation living then, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Jesus is describing, ladies and gentlemen, a civilization that is frozen in fear, global cardiac arrest. And all the emergency measures in the world cannot seem to help anymore because the old political solutions and the ancient economic remedies simply cannot stabilize Earth's debilitating sickness. Something has gone terribly wrong. And the question to ask is, look, is this, is this good news or is this bad news? Well, I'll tell you what, that depends on your perspective. I mean, last evening we noted there are over 1,500 of them in this book, predictions that promise the return of Jesus Christ to this planet at the end of the world. One, you think about it, one and a half thousand times you may read throughout these pages the clarion announcement that life as we know it on planet Earth, this endless cycle is not going to be endless, not endless hopelessness, not endless despair and dysfunction. It one day, shoo, is going to be cut off. And Christ will return 1,500 times in this book. You see, the God of the cosmos says, I'm going to have my last word. I'll have the last word. This tragic experiment in human suffering, I'm going to bring it to an end. I'm going to physically, literally, personally return to this planet. That's what's been promised. That's what's been prophesied. Now, folks, what's going on here? I need you to catch this thought. God has given us his word in advance which is exactly what you would expect a friend to do, isn't it? I'm not going to let you go through this without warning you. I want you to go to that old, old book way back in the Old Testament. We were there opening night of the Next Millennium Seminar, the little book of Amos. Take a look at this. This is page 889. Amos chapter 3. There really is a, a beautiful little vignette of God tucked away in this verse. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. I want you to see this portrait of God before we turn to the great chapter that prophesies the signs of the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. Now notice this. Friends don't spend their lives trying to catch each other off guard. And here's the promise. God's not going to do anything without first revealing it to his circle of friends called the prophets. He'll give the word to them and they will give the word to us. That's the assurance right here. Now why is God sending the word to the prophets? Turn the page. To the text we were at just uh, a few days ago at the opening of the Next Millennium Seminar. This is chapter 4, verse 12. What does it say there? Prepare to meet whom? Prepare to meet your God. God says, I'm not going to leave you in the dark. I want you to be ready when I come. I'm not trying to trick you up. And so I've sent my secrets through the prophets. Listen to them and you'll be warned. You'll be ready. What a God. No surprise attack here. Well, I ask you again, is this uh, bad news or is this good news? Of course, it is extremely good news for the terribly bad news we're living in tonight in Bosnia and America and Rwanda and China and Russia and Korea and Liberia and India today. I say it is indeed good news to know that the God of the universe is coming to end this nonstop litany of heartache once and for all. All right, now, the question is, and here's why we're here. Enough of this setting the table, Dwight. Let's get on with it. All right. How close are we to the end of planet Earth? That's what they wanted to know on BET. Tavis Smythe said, all right, what do you think? And we had a chance for 45 minutes to uh, reflect on that. For the rest of our time together, what I want to do is take a 2,000-year-old 
set of predictions that Jesus himself made, and we're going to read them tonight as if we were reading our very present global headlines. There isn't a person on the planet tonight who is not going to be able to simultaneously, as we read these predictions, sense that, in fact, we are living at that moment imminent before the return of Christ. Now, one word of counsel, please. As we prepare to read this, you, please keep recalling in your mind, wait a minute, now don't forget, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. He said that last night, I will come again. Folks, we are dealing with some very, very good news. I don't apologize for this. It's, I am going to have to share with you some extremely depressing statistics. But all the while, keep remembering, God is going to have the last word. And when it gets this bad, it's the night, the last hour of darkness before the morning. All right? So with that, Let's move in. Let's move to this epic of chapters concerning the end of the world. It's Matthew chapter 24, page 960. Matthew 24. And we're going to hit some of the highlights. We're going to do this rapid fire. You, you, get a, you get it. Don't forget, you get a next millennium seminar study guide as you leave. That will augment some of this. You already have the lecture outline tonight, and so you're following that, some of you on the side, as well as you're jotting down a few of these stats that I'm going to give you in just a moment. And by the way, I've got some wow kind of mind-boggling statistics that we're going to share. But let's begin here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple... And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. I want to tell you something. They are absolutely bedazzled by this spectacular edifice. You know what, folks? We have no pictures today. We have nothing that can capture the glory of Jerusalem's temple in the time of Christ. I was just in Jerusalem uh, a few weeks ago, in the month of June, actually. And uh, one, of my, one of my hobbies whenever I travel around the world is I love to go to, to, to holy places. I like to go into cathedrals. I love to go into synagogues, to mosques, to, to Buddhist and, uh, temples and Hindu shrines because this is the place where the human soul is reaching out to the mysterium, as they put it in Latin, this mysterious presence of the divine in the universe. And, and, and I suppose every place of worship has its own innate beauty and glory, but I'm telling you this summer, when we were there in Jerusalem, there is nothing left of the temple, but on an acre of land inside the city of Jerusalem, artists and archaeologists have put together a miniature scale resemblance of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD before Titus and the Roman armies absolutely raised that to the ground. And the artist's depiction of the temple itself, it is no wonder archaeologists believe that that temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. You can understand the disciples as they're walking out of this temple for the last time, by the way, Jesus will never be back in that temple again. As they're walking out, they're saying, Lord, wow, look at this place. Can you believe it? And then Jesus speaks. Verse 2, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. I'm going to tell you this. To a man, our Jewish guides this summer, to a man, all said, you know what? This Jesus of Nazareth, that prediction he made came absolutely true. And they took us around the ruins, what is left. Now, the western wall of the ancient temple, the western foundation, is all that is left. It's, it's the most holy place in all of Judaism. They call it the Wailing Wall. It used to be, well, they used to call it the Wailing Wall. Now they say, no, 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 don't call it Wailing Wall. It's the western wall. I went up to that wall. Only men are allowed to approach a certain section of that wall. I went up there and I bowed my head with all these who are bowing and praying, earnest-hearted, Men and women who long to reach out and touch God, who long for his forever friendship. This is all they have left. The guide said this prediction of Jesus came literally precisely true. There's not a stone left upon another. Now the disciples are very troubled. Verse 3, and as they, they go down into the Kidron Valley and then they go up into the Mount of Olives. Verse 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us. I mean, this is, we never heard this before. Tell us, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples are so emotionally distraught that they, they, they wrap, they kind of blend them all together. When is this temple going to be destroyed? And when will the world end? They, they weave it all into one. And so Jesus, in response, rather than segregating those two separate events, weaves the events all together even as they asked him. What we are about to read is the answer of Jesus Christ to the question, what will the world be like when you return, the end of the age. All right, Jesus is going to give us a series of categories. I call them categories of signs. Number one, he will give us signs in the religious world. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Verse 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive Many. I will never forget attending this meeting as long as I live. I was a teenager on the island of Guam, the green pearl of the Pacific. Some out-of-town, out out-of-country visiting dignitary had come to this little island, and so we were having a special evening meeting. And the, the, uh, the official is up here at the lectern, and he's speaking to the crowd. I'm sitting you know, a few pews back in the audience when all of a sudden I see a scraggly-dressed old man with a holy beard on and, you know, just tatters, come walking up. I'd never seen this man before, but he came walking right up the stairs onto the platform until he's standing right beside the speaker. Now, the speaker's a guest. He doesn't know, who is this guy? You know, maybe he's somebody important. And so the speaker defers to him, and the old man gets in front of the lectern, and I'll never forget this. He stretched out his arms, and he announced, I am Jesus Christ, and I have returned to this world. You know what? As a teenager, I've got to be honest with you, my, car, my heart went, boom, 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 boom. whoa, do you think? Now, a few moments later, the police squad car came and took him away, and I said, you know, it can't be Jesus going in that squad car. <laughs> Jesus isn't talking, folks, about a little isolated incident here and there. Did you catch the word we read just a moment ago? Many. There is going to be rampant, rampant deception, religious chicanery, all in the name of saying, I am the Messiah. You think about it. The proliferation today of religious cults of every hue and shape is absolutely alarming. In my nation, here in the United States, the New Age movement, it has struck a responsive chord deep in the heart of the American psyche. They did a survey. USA Today, you've heard of that newspaper. They did a survey, some 20,000 people in a sample group of 113,000 people 20,000 of them said they accepted the theories of the New Age movement. I mean, you go into the bookstores of America, and it's this way in Europe, by the way, shelf after shelf devoted to these slick, sophisticated, suave, sometimes bizarre and banal claims of this modern religion. And I want to say something. By the way, and just, uh, I was reading Newsweek magazine that just came last night, looking at it this morning. They now have a New Age guru who's helping the financial investors on Wall Street. I mean, it's everywhere. But do you know what, folks? Movie stars, executives, intellectuals flocking to this Pied Piper's chant. Do you know what's going on? Because organized religion in the West has failed to meet the gnawing hunger that Eastern and Western civilization is experiencing for the supernatural. Organized religion has missed the boat for too many, and they're turning anywhere they can to find that hunger satisfied. How did Jesus put it a moment ago when we read it in Luke? Men's and women's hearts failing them for fear. A religion of cold formality and rote liturgy cannot assuage the fears or satisfy the longings deep within the human heart. What did Jesus say here? Many will come in my name. Hey, does the name David Koresh ring a bell with you? Waco, Texas, April 1993. How about the name Jim Jones? Remember Jonestown, Guyana? November 1978, mass suicide. And by the way, I just need to throw this in in defense of my own homeland. Lest you think that all the religious charlatans in the world come from the United States, I remind you that there's some very fertile eastern lands that produce their own gurus and the flower children of the east and the west go pattering after them. The fact of the matter is Scientology, the Reverend Sun Moon in the Unification Church et al. The world is filled tonight with a prolific of cults and self-proclaim, I am Christ. Christ is just Greek. It means Messiah. Self-proclaim Messiahs 
Oh, Jesus is right. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. He gives us signs in the religious world, and now he's going to give us signs in the political world. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There is no question that we are living tonight in a proliferation of war. Obviously, no one can predict war or the end of war even. I was flying over to Poland, your homeland, Chris, flying into Warsaw few months ago, and I'm reading the International Herald, which is the English-speaking paper for Europeans who want to read in English. As I'm reading an op-ed piece, I read about the Atlanta-based Center for Conflict Resolution. They've done study. How many wars have been fought on this planet over the last 10 years? And do you know what they're finding out? An average of 35 to 39 wars per year are taking place on this planet. He said, come on, no, let me run by the names. You remember Rwanda, Bosnia, Somalia, Ireland, Korea, Cambodia, Liberia, Palestine, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Kosovo, and on and on and on. It is a sad fact that tonight many of our viewers around this planet need nobody to talk to them about what it's like to live in a war-torn nation. You know it from firsthand experience. We live tonight within a world at war, not to mention the cities in our own nation torn apart by gang war. Jesus says, when you see this proliferation of war, this ascendancy of conflict among the nations of the earth, then you will know that the end is near. Eh, folks, it's not that there haven't been any wars before in the history of the human race. Of course there have been wars, but you know what? We've had two global wars in this century. Neither one ended our taste for war. Our own nation, this nation, host nation tonight, has been through Korea, Vietnam, and what do we get from it? A row upon row of white stars of David and white crosses. That's all we got out of it. We know the meaning of war, although this Gen X generation knows nothing about it because it's been entirely cut off from that reality. Nobody needs a primer tonight about living in a world at war. Jesus says, so shell-shocked will be this generation. It must be our generation. You know what? We can sit here and watch the evening news while we're saying, please pass the potatoes, and they're shooting each other up on the screen. Oh, I'll have some salad now, please. Pew! We don't know. It's war. I mean, come on, it's war. You know what? I'm going to throw this in right here. The problem is Hollywood has frozen our emotions. We are so accustomed to violence on our screens that when it happens and it's supposedly real on our television sets, it's just, ah, it's just more entertainment. That's what's happened. Somebody's stolen a march on the human psyche. That's what's happened. Hey, you want to talk about nuclear proliferation? Huh? Iraq, Iran, North Korea, India and Pakistan. Three days ago it says they've broken off their talks for a while and the whole world is jittery. How many more breakaway republics are going to join the nuclear arms club of this planet? I mean, where are these disappearing stockpiles of former Soviet Union nuclear armaments? Where are they going? All it takes is some third-rate, third-world country to blackmail the entire planet with nuclear threats. Oh, by the way, speaking of nuclear, when atomic scientist Charles Urey witnessed the first atomic explosion back in 1945, through his tears he muttered these words, I am standing on the place where the end of the world began. Jesus said, come on, you will see and hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. One UN diplomat described man's vain attempts to somehow establish global peace with these words, we have tried so hard, but we have failed so miserably. Jesus' predictive chronicling of Earth's last headlines speaks of political signs, signs in the religious world, signs in the political world. He's not through. Now he gives us signs in the natural world. The rest of verse 7, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Let me run some stats by you. Jot these down as fast as you can. Do you realize that 40,000 babies die every single day in the third world, which really should be called the two-thirds world? Two-thirds of the world. That's one baby dying of starvation, get this, every 2.16 seconds. Another baby dying on this planet. How'd you eat tonight? You look well-fed. 
India, Asia, Somalia, Africa. 37% of the people on this planet tonight cannot buy food enough to sustain the bare necessities. 800 million people tonight are undernourished. According to the United Nations Agency, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the global grain harvest increased by just 2.3% since 1990, while the global population was growing by 10%. We can't keep up. Robert S. McNamara, president of the World Bank, I'm quoting him now, population growth is the gravest issue the world faces during the next decade and will have catastrophic consequences if we do not act. The problem will be solved by famine, riot, insurrection, and war. But Jesus goes on. Famine, and then what's the next word? Pestilence. Heard of mad cow disease? E. coli, e. coli virus and a hundred new varieties and strains of cancer, the AIDS epidemic, on and on and on and on. And by the way, I want to say something right here. I want to insert this. Speaking of AIDS, I do not believe the AIDS epidemic or any human pestilence is punishment from this God that we have been discovering who is not somebody to be afraid of, but somebody to be a friend of. I realize that there are some people who may share some similar convictions to mine about this book, who in fact are touting on the news, it's God's wreaking down his vengeance. I believe those people are dead wrong. I want to say to my homosexual friends who are watching right now, I know you've taken a hit. I know some of you. I have a recovering homosexual friend. I know you struggle. You long for the fullness that life can, can bring. I want to tell you something, sir. I want to tell you something, madam. Don't you ever let go. This forever friendship that you and I have been covering night after night, this is a forever friendship for you. It will bring peace to you. It is Jesus' gift of faith to you. It is his gift of power and the promise of victory. He has exactly what your heart needs. You keep holding on to him. Don't you listen to what others say. He is your friend, and you are his friend tonight. He loves you that much, and we love you too. Yeah, we've got pestilence on this planet. We've got pestilence inside of us. We've got pestilence outside of us. You want to talk about the ecological crisis? What did they have down in Rio de Janeiro the other day? Well, what, another day, a couple years ago, the Save the Earth Summit. All the bright minds of Earth. What can we do? We're burning up the rainforest. We're destroying the habitats. What's going to happen? You know what, folks? We've got ocean contaminations now. What else do we have? We have... We have uh, what do, they, what do they call this rain that gets contaminated? Acid rain. We've got acid rain on the planet now. Do you know what? Radioactive garbage. If Jesus Christ does not return to this planet soon, the human race is going to go ahead and destroy it anyway. You think about it. Lester Brown, president of the Washington-based World Watch Institute, said, and I quote him, We do not have generations. We have only years in which to attempt to turn things around, end quote. Jesus goes on. He talks about famines and pestilences, and then he mentions earthquakes. Jot these statistics down. The rise in global quakes is astounding. In the 19th century, get this, there were only 2,119 recorded <clears throat> earthquakes during those 100 years. 2,119. In 1990, five years ago, 1993 alone, there were 21,476. Wow. Those graphs are going up. Of course, there have always been earthquakes on this planet, but never have we seen this kind of numbing ascendancy. Get this. Prior to the 20th century, there were only 10 major quakes, that's over 6.0 on the Richter scale, in the history. We are now experiencing three thousand quakes a year over 6.0 on the Richter scale every year on this planet. What's going on? I mean, life beneath the crust, life above the crust, it's almost like the planet is trying to shake us up and wake us up, get ready. The end is near and Jesus is coming soon. Man, 1.5 million people have perished in quakes over the last 90 years on this planet. As I, you know, when, I, <clears throat> when I was a boy in Kobe, Japan, I mean, we'd wake up. You'd wake up in the middle of the night and your bed is just going like this. It's crazy. Kobe, Japan, five years ago, four years ago, rather, leveled that city by an earthquake, killer quake. And, of course, seismologists are all waiting, especially those of you out in California, for the big one. Yeah, we know about quakes. Listen, not just earthquakes, by the way. One of my parishioners, who's a CPA, sent me this, this statistic from his CPA letter. 
I'm quoting now, according to the Federal Register, which is a U.S. government publication, get this, 40 out of our 50 states had every county within them reporting some sort of disaster in 1996. 40 out of the 50 states, every county in those states. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? You know what? The question we ought to be asking tonight is not what's going on. The question to be asked tonight is who's coming back? Maybe nature itself is trying to wake us up to this moment. All right, what have we had? We've had signs in the, uh, we've had signs in the religious world. We've had signs in the political world. We've had signs in the natural world. Now let's take a look at some signs in the social world. Very pointed here, verse 12. Drop down to verse 12. Jesus still speaking. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, before we, we, we share some stats here, I want to share one other. It's a, a parallel passage in the New Testament. Paul makes the same social predictor. Take a look over here, First, uh, 2 Timothy, rather, chapter 3. This is, well, we're going to put it, uh, forget the page number. We're going to put it on the screen. Let's put it on the screen. But know this. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come for men and women will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such, Paul writes, such people from them turn away. Now, you, folks, you put these two social indicators side by side, as we just did, and you get a sense of civil lawlessness and moral lovelessness that is going to destroy the fabric of our society. All right, I'm going to run some stats by you in just a second here. I'm going to share three exhibits. But before I do, I need to, I need to insert this caveat. The moral dysfunction of this planet tonight has affected all of us. I realize that. We are all sinners, everybody here. We have all fallen far short of God's ideal for us as human beings. Now look, I realize some of us fall in public more than others, but we have all failed. And all of us are freely offered God's forever friendship gift of grace and forgiveness for every failure I have, public or private. The reason I'm saying this is because in the litany of statistics I'm now going to share with you, I realize there may be a category here or a condition that some of you are going to say, you know, that's about me. It's going to trigger feelings of guilt. I don't want you to f feel that guilt at all. What's true for you, even more than that statistic, is that God is inviting you and me to find in Him forgiveness and grace and the promise of a brand new chapter ahead. All right? So I'm going to give you three exhibits. Exhibit A. Oh, this is a heavy one. This comes in a litany of disturbing social indicators given by a gentleman named William Bennett. William Bennett, Ph.D., Doctor of Philosophy, J.D., Doctor of Jurisprudence or Law. He used to be the drug czar here in the United States. He used to be the secretary of the Department of Education here in, the, here in America. He wrote an essay. I read this essay. It is a biting commentary over the, the alarm he senses regarding the moral freefall that we are experiencing in America, and I'm, I'm going to pick on my own homeland. It, it occurs to me it may be true for your nation as well. I want to read some statistics, but he begins with this paragraph, these two sentences. Something has gone wrong with America. America is not in danger of becoming a third world country. We are too rich, too proud, too strong to allow that to happen to us. It is not that we live in a society completely devoid of virtue, but there is a lot less of this than there ought to be, and we know it. Let me briefly, he goes on, outline some of the empirical evidence that points to cultural decline. Here come the statistics. Since 1960, our population has increased 41%. The gross domestic product has nearly tripled. That means the economy is going up, up, up. However... During that same 35-year period, there was a 560% increase in violent crime, more than 400% increase in illegitimate births, a quadrupling of divorces, a tripling of the percentage of children living in single-parent homes, more than a 200% increase in the teenage suicide rate. Bennett's point, some of us are saying in America, oh, my, man, everything's coming up roses with our economy. He says, if it's coming up roses, why are we going down morally? And he raises a very good point. He goes on. 
And then there are the results of an ongoing teacher survey over the years. Get this, there's some school teachers in this group tonight. Over the years, teachers have been asked to identify the top problems in American schools. Back in 1940, watch this. These were the top seven problems in, America, in American schools. Number one, talking out of turn. Number two, chewing gum. Number three, making noise. Number four, running in the hall. Number five, cutting in line. Number six, dress code infractions. And number seven, littering. You see that list right there? That's 1940. Now they survey the teachers 50 years later, 1990. What's our biggest problems? Here they are, seven of them. Number one, drug use. Number two, alcohol abuse. Number three, pregnancy. Number th four, suicide. Number five, rape. Number six, robbery. Number seven, assault. Something's going on on this planet, ladies and gentlemen. We are falling apart at our moral seams. That's what's going on tonight. Exhibit B, it's a corroboration of Jesus and Paul's societal description. The alarming statistics of crime. Let me run these by you. In this country, there is one serious crime every two seconds. A murder every 23 seconds. A forcible rape every six minutes. A robbery every 58 seconds. A motor vehicle stolen every 28 seconds. A burglary every eight seconds. How did Jesus describe it in Matthew? Lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. You remember that line we read in Luke a moment ago? Men's hearts failing them from fear and from expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. By the way, let me catch my breath. It's not just America, my homeland of Japan. This used to be the nation known the world over for its safe streets. Japan has been rocked with some heinous crimes of late, and they are shaken to their moral core. What's gone wrong to the great land of the rising sun? The whole world, Brazil, Russia, the U.S. Crime is on the ascendancy. Describing our human race just before he returns, Jesus said, the love of many would grow cold because lawlessness abounds. What's that mean? Take a look at the parallel passage here. What would Jesus say to us? For those of us who survive, Luke chapter 21, it's page 1019. Luke chapter 21, just one verse here. Luke 21, verse 34, Jesus speaking, but take heed lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. Hearts failing them with fear, weighed down, how did he put it here? With the cares of this life. You know, what a poignant description of the economic anxiety going on on this planet in this last generation. Nothing can weigh the heart more heavily than a sense of instability when it comes to your own finances. You want to talk about the world financial markets tonight? We don't have time. One day, the bubble is going to burst. I was visiting a few evenings ago with a, with a, a gentleman from England over supper. He deals in um, foreign currency exchanges. And as I listened to the edge on his voice and realized the roller coaster kind of life, he has to survive professionally. No question, Christ describing this generation, hearts weighed down with the cares of this life. Remind you that we're living for the first time in history in a global economy. All it takes is for one of these supermarkets, the market in Japan or Indonesia or Hong Kong, and like a series of dominoes, this entire global strategy can take the entire planet down. Our own stock market. I know everybody is saying it's on the up and up, but you know what I keep thinking? I keep thinking of our opening words with the Titanic generation. When they say to you, peace and safety, look out, because sudden destruction is on the way. How should we live on the edge of eternity? I want to go now to our final gospel, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. This is page 984. How then shall we live? We've seen a, just a rapid-fire sequence, statistics, kind of mind-boggling and overwhelming, I think, for all of us tonight. But I want to end with the words of Jesus here. How can we live in the midst of this moral fabric that is shredding and a society that appears to be going down? This is page 984, Mark chapter 13. Let's begin in verse 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, but only the Father. Read on, verse 33. Take heed, 
Watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man, Jesus says, going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work. And he commanded the doorkeeper to keep watch. Verse 35, watch therefore, Jesus speaks. You generation, you people living, when all of these headlines come true, you watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Verse 36, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And I say to you what I say to all, watch. Watch and pray, which being interpreted means keep awake and keep in touch. I'm coming soon. My friends, Jesus Christ is soon to return to this planet. What should you do? Believe him. Trust him. Place your hope in him. Keep in touch with him. It is our only ticket out of this world that is going up in smoke. I want to tell you a story to close with tonight. They, they called him the old man of the mountain, his name Harry Truman, not to be confused with the president by the same name. Old Harry Truman lived alone in that mountain cabin, lived with his menagerie of dogs and cats. These were his kids. He lived in the foothills, foothills of a mountain. Have you ever, ever heard of this mountain? Mount St. Helens. I was living in Oregon, Karen and I and our family, back in May of 1980. There is, it's April. We're watching it on the news. Harry Truman enjoying his life in the great out of doors. I saw Harry interviewed on the news one day. That old codger of a mountain man, you know, beard studded up, toothless grin, the reporter sticking their microphones into his face, asking him, Harry, how's it feel to live on a mountain that's about to go up? You see, the mountain had been trembling. They had been receiving seismic indicators. Well, there had been little puffs of smoke, a little ball once in a while of lava had popped out of the top, but nothing serious yet. Until the day, and here's where, like a gaggle, all of those reporters came with their television cameras, along with a park ranger from the U.S. For US Forestry Service. They come up to announce to Harry Truman, Harry, this mountain, every indication we have speaks that this mountain is going to go up in smoke. We would like you just for a few days to come off the mountain, huh? Come down with us. we got a place for you down in the valley. You'll be safe. And when it's all over, you can come back here. If nothing happens, you got your cabin. And I'll never forget that moment. And I saw him look into the cameras and that big old grin of his as he shook his head and said, I'm not going to let anybody traipse me off of this mountain. This mountain is my home. I don't believe those newfangled signs that you people watch. And all the while, the cameras are clicking and the, 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 uh, the uh, video cams are whirring. And the reporters laughed, and they drove away. And it was on May, what was the date? May 18, 1980. I'll never forget that morning. I awakened four and a half hours to the south of Mount St. Helens, and there were the news bulletins. At that moment in the morning of May 18, Mount St. Helens had indeed, as you're seeing on the screen, blown its volcanic stack with the force of a nuclear detonation. And now they are, these news helicopters hovering with their news cams in the distance, safety, looking, peering, and finally, as they sweep down over that, that horizon of devastation, hours and hours later, they determine they can send a rescue party to the top. That rescue party eventually is allowed to go in. They are looking for old Harry Truman. But alas, you know the story. The old man of the mountain was not there. All that greeted the rescuers was a white lunar landscape. Flattened the old cabin and the old man gone forever. You know why? He didn't believe the signs. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you believe the signs? Huh? I'm telling you, folks, with all the, the earnestness I can muster, Jesus Christ is our only ticket off of this planet into a place called home. And that's why for the last few evenings, I've been rather earnest, because I really do believe that we are living tonight at the end of time. Jesus is about to come. And it makes all the sense in the world to me to invite you to reach out 
and receive that forever friendship. Wherever you are on the planet tonight, the whole planet, not just a continent, the whole world is going to end. A moment of fear? Are you kidding? It's a moment of faith. It's a moment of friendship. A friendship with the one who stretches out his arms and he says, come to me and I'll make you safe and I'll give you rest. You want to come to him? How many want to join me tonight just raising a hand and saying, yes, Jesus, I, I want to be ready when you come. I want to raise two hands. I want to be there when you come. Take me home. You are my forever friend. Let's pray together. Oh, Christ, the words of Holy Scripture, your words, speak to our hearts tonight. We're living on a planet disintegrating faster than the statistics can keep up. But dear Jesus, please, in this moment, accept our raised hands as our prayer and our choice to receive your forever friendship and our ticket to a forever and ever with you in that home, in your name, amen.